The trouble with old steam locomotives part 19. Refitting the repaired valve gear brackets and making some connecting rod bushes. And here's the locomotive on its side on the bench, just waiting for me to fit the right hand side valve gear bracket. And here it is. Amongst my collection of odd comments from viewers was one from a viewer recently who was having a go at the bracket. He seemed very interested in why it was cut away. The answer is simple, to clear the wheel. Even miniature steam locomotives do have suspension and the wheels go up and down. Anyway, that's enough of that. On with the job. I'm using a pair of surgical forceps to hold a 2BA nut underneath so I can screw the 2BA bolt in place. I'm using a socket for this, which is not a very good fit on the 2BA bolt. This is much better. It's called a box key, and it's a really good tight fit on the bolt head. And without shearing off the bolt, I'm making sure that it's tight. That's an easy one done. Now for the more difficult one. I cannot get in with the forceps to hold the nut in place under the bolt, unless I do it like this with the nut at an angle. And once again, I use the box key for the final tightening. Getting the small spanner to fit on the nut underneath at this side is quite tricky, but I got there in the end. Here we have it then, one bracket, complete with cutaway to clear the wheel, mounted to the frames. If you've been watching the series, you will have seen me fit the bracket on the other side, although I didn't really have to take the bracket off, because it was only the threaded shaft that had worked loose from the centre of the bracket. Now it's time to fit the valve gear, starting with the bell crank. This engine's valve gear is quite well designed. The bell crank fits on the shaft, on the parallel part of the shaft, and there's just enough thread at the top to fit a retaining nut. Unfortunately, the retaining nut for this side was broken. It had a split in it. I showed this in an earlier video. The first thing to do is to fasten the link from the reversing lever to the top part of the bell crank. This was quite fiddly. I had to use a very small spanner because there was no room to get a socket in there. So what about this retaining nut? Well, I was going to make one. But then, in the box of bits that came off this engine, I found one. And I'm going to retain it with some Loctite 243. So where did this retaining nut come from? As you can see, it's made from brass. And it doesn't really matter what it's made from, because this bell crank only rocks back and forth when you move the reversing lever. Most of the time, it's in forward position. Where did this brass nut come from? Well, it was originally used to hold the water bypass valve to the spectacle plate. If you remember, that's where I fitted the whistle valve. This is a good way of retaining nuts and bolts. Put some paint on them. I don't really need to do this, it's just a good tip. I used to work on a lot of electronic equipment at one time, and I noticed that often the threads of retaining bolts had just got a blob of paint on them. So I'm replicating that for old time's sake. Look at this clip carefully. The paint is self-leveling. It's time now to do something about the connecting rod bush. Throw it in the bin perhaps, but no, I need it as a pattern to make another one. To start the job, I'm using a micrometer to measure the diameter of the original crank pin. It's about seven thou below half an inch. And what's this? A mirror in my workshop? Is it so I can check my makeup? Er, uh, no. Here's a top tip that you may find useful. Having a mirror in the workshop is quite an essential thing really, particularly a magnifying mirror, that makes it better, just in case you get something in your eye. I don't mean a javelin, or even an arrow, like at the Battle of Hastings in 1066. It's just in case I get a small metal particle in my eye from the lathe. That's why it's on the shelf above the lathe. That way I'll be able to see what I'm doing as I pull it out with a big pair of pliers. I had a small mirror in my other workshop, but during the move it somehow got lost. And this one's much better. So if you work alone in your workshop frequently, buy yourself a mirror. It's a very useful thing to have. When I went over to Blackgate's Engineering last week, I bought some phosphor bronze. This is actually leaded bronze. The red stuff is really horrible to machine, and it doesn't seem to wear any better or any worse than this stuff does. I'm about to make a new bush to fit into this hole in the connecting rod. The first thing to do was to turn down the outer diameter to the same as the bush. I marked it with a felt tip pen so I know how far to go when I turn down the inner diameter that fits in the connecting rod. For the deep roofing cuts I decided to use back gear. This allows me to take a much deeper cut without the chippings flying all over the place. And even though I have a really nice mirror now in the workshop to get bits of metal out of my eyes, I'd rather there weren't any bits of metal in my eyes to start with. 
You may think I'm labouring the point, and health and safety can be made fun of, but really, some things are serious. Any metal chippings coming off a lathe tool are going to be hot and sharp, and phosphor bronze and brass are really sharp. So whenever you're doing jobs like this, wear eye protection, it's essential. If you feel the need to become a Long John Silver impersonator, then OK, don't bother. These days I naturally wear eye protection, I have my glasses on. But glasses are not proof against heavy weights hitting you in the eye, or objects. So as a cautionary note, always wear eye protection when you're doing any kind of engineering jobs, it makes sense. This is important, not the drilling of the centre hole, or even drilling the hole down the centre of the work using a drill that is one imperial size under half an inch. I'm referring to the outer diameter of the work, the part that goes into the connecting rod. This needs to be exactly, and I mean exactly, the same size as the hole in the connecting rod. Please watch the video all the way through before you send me a comment. Recently I made a video advert to advertise the fact that my 7.25 inch gauge Titch locomotive is for sale. And everything was fine while it was on Patreon, but the minute that it went public, I can't believe how many people wrote in and asked how much the engine was, even though it's clearly displayed at the end of the video. Similarly, please don't send me a message asking why the diameter of the bush needs to be exactly the same as the hole in the connecting rod, I will explain shortly. What I'm doing at the moment is reaming the hole down the centre of the bush, and by the way, I've drilled the hole a lot deeper, I'm going to make two bushes in one go in this video. For the reaming operation, I've slowed the lathe down, it's in back gear, and you need to progress both ways very slowly. I've speeded up the lathe once again for the parting off operation. If I was to ream the hole at this speed, then the hole would become oversized. The video at this point is also speeded up to double normal speed. I actually sharpened the parting tool before this operation and I think it's a bit low on the centre height. That's the first bush parted off, now it's time to make the second one. First of all I'm turning the outer diameter as before. Here I'm turning the inner diameter to once again exactly the same size as the hole in the connecting rod. This clip is speeded up by a factor of 4, 400%, 4 times normal speed. And in no time at all, it's time to part off the second bush. I've fitted the original bush into the chuck, so I can use it as a gauge to set the thickness of the flange. The flanges on the parts I made were a good bit thicker than the one on the original bush, to allow me to face them off. And as I commenced the cut, the lathe tool started to dig into the metal. I adjusted it and removed the ridge with some emery cloth. Here's the finished bush in place on the crank pin. I'm having a feel at the tolerance because don't forget the crank pin has worn several thou lower than half an inch. I had an alternative. What I could have done is bored this with a boring tool, machining it to a few thou under size. But instead I used a reamer. And this is why it's very important that the external diameter of this bush is exactly the same, and I mean exactly in every way, as the hole in the connecting rod. In this next clip, I'm going to fit the phosphor bronze bush into the hole in the steel connecting rod. It's ultraviolence time. I could have used a hydraulic press or the vice, I used a soft hammer, but the outcome is the same. The bush is made from phosphor bronze, which is softer than steel, and now it's pressed into the connecting rod, it's too small to fit on the crank pin. Hence the need for a bit of gentle hand reaming. When making connecting rod or coupling rod bushes, it's very important to remember, once you fit them, re-drill the oil holes, and I'm doing just that at the moment, using a 3 seconds of an inch twist drill. The coupling rod is now a perfect fit on the crank pin, and now it's time to fit the return crank. I'm tapping the taper pin in place, and here I'm tightening the pinch bolt. What I need to do now is refit the nuts that hold the valve gear together, using some Loctite 243 thread locker as previously shown. I tighten the small nuts onto the shafts, and the shafts are just long enough to tighten the nuts onto the shaft without them putting any pressure on the valve links. The very last part of the job is to fit the small end crosshead pin, and here I'm holding this in place using three brass hexagon bolts. 
and carefully tightening them using my Barco spanner. Time, I think, for a compressed air test. That was in forward gear. I wonder if reverse gear is going to work. It didn't before. And yes, it runs very well in both directions. In fact, it runs slightly better in reverse than it does in forward. My compressor in the workshop is a very, very small, silent type. So it doesn't have much capacity, I can't run it for very long. But I think the repair has been successful. I'm going to leave the engine running to the end of the video. Thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainsteam Models website. Click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that you will find it very easy to find other videos that you may like to watch.